Hey, it's Chris, the Supply Chain Doctor. Over the years, I've interviewed some of the brightest minds and successful leaders in supply chain management. In May 2020, I sat down with supply chain leader Ken Ackerman to learn more about him and collect a little supply chain management history. After the interview, Ken told me about a similar interview he had with Dr. Jim Stock many years prior and the related work Dr. Stock did. In November 2020, I was able to catch up with Dr. Stock to learn about him and his work. As an academic in the world of transportation, logistics, and what we now call supply chain management, Jim was well connected to many of the original academic thought leaders in the space. Jim did interviews with many of these thought leaders and shared them with me. The list includes Ken Ackerman, Don Bowersox, James Haskett, Bud Lalonde, John Langley Jr., Tom Menser, Tom Spee, and Daniel Wren. To carry on the great work started by Dr. Jim Stock, I'm dusting off these interviews and bringing them to you to help you get a better understanding of supply chain management and hopefully become a more effective supply chain professional. Shifting gears for a minute, uh, uh, Bud, and back to some of the personal things uh, separate from the professional. Uh, do you have any military background or experience? No, I, I say I was born between wars. Okay. My only military experience was ROTC. And if I were still in the ROTC, I'd probably still be cleaning rifles uh, because I had so many demerits. So I, I, I wasn't quite out, cut out. I don't, I'm not sure anybody is, but I'm not cut out. I, I didn't feel I was cut out for for uh, military service. Okay. I did try to join uh, the uh, the uh, Navy Air, uh, Air Force one time, uh, but I, I discovered I was too big to sit in the plane, so uh, I, they canceled me out very early in the process. Uh, okay. But uh, no, I have I have no military experience. I've had a lot of military experience uh, with uh, with military people. I mean, about probably 10 or 12 of those 60 uh, PhDs are Air Force officers. Uh, and uh, I have been on the board of visitors at AFID. I have been on the board of visitors at LMAC, the Army Logistics and Material Command. Uh, and, and that was a like a four-year term. Uh, and, and I've been a consultant to DOD and and uh, and uh, uh, a wide range of, of government, U.S. post office and, and so on. So I've had a lot of experience with military and government, uh, but it's not been as a participant. It's been as a okay. consultant. Now you mentioned that when you went to Colorado, uh, uh, you were married and. Uh, you already began a family. How did you and uh, Barbara, your wife, meet? And then tell us about your, your family. <laughs> uh, Barbara and I met on a blind date. Her best friend and my best friend uh, fixed us up. Uh, and, uh, and the rest is history. You know, we, uh, we, had, uh, we have three children. Uh, the... Uh, the eldest passed away, uh, unfortunately, prematurely, uh, and uh, and that's uh, something that certainly was a big bump in our road. Uh, the uh, the middle child, uh, a daughter, works in healthcare, uh, and my my son was in the horse business. But he is now, he's breeding horses, quarter horses, but he is now, he has now returned to school. And, and you know, people kid me a little bit. They say, none of your children followed in your path. Uh, my daughter that passed away was a social worker. Uh, she worked for the Central Ohio AIDS Task Force. And, and, uh, and uh, my uh, uh, middle son, or am I, my, uh, and the son is actually the youngest, uh, as I said, was in the horse business just about his whole uh, uh, working career. Recently, he returned to school. 
and he's he's going on uh, for a PhD in epidemiology uh, and uh, so they didn't pick business but they did pick my profession so uh, it took a while he's 43 years old but uh, and and also recently this year my daughter returned to uh, to school she has a master's degree and she's going to get a PhD so uh, it, uh, it it took them a while to figure out that the profession was what they wanted, but uh, uh, they uh, they are both very excited and doing very well in the PhD program. Now, as you look back at your children, what uh, would you have considered your main goal as a parent? Uh, I think to raise uh, a child to have a, a balance sense of, of proportion and, and a, a, a good moral compass uh, and you know St. Thomas said give me a child till he's what six years old and then you can do whatever you want I don't buy into that but certainly giving you a child till they're 18 you should be able to instill that in your children mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that, that was our goal and, and like I think most parents, uh, if you could do it over, you might do some things differently because you're amateurs at that job <laughs> and you learn like amateurs for what's going on. Now, what way or ways do you think you influenced your children the most? Well, uh, I think all of them have undergraduate degrees. Uh, uh, two of them have uh, two of them have advanced degrees, and two of them are working on on PhDs. And so, I would hope that that some of the things that we've been talking about have been obvious to them, uh, and and probably by indirection, not by saying you ought to be a professor, uh, but uh, they've come to understand what professors do and and I think to respect knowledge and and to enjoy seeking knowledge and and uh, and I think they're good people and and that's important mm. in raising your children so if we had them here today what what uh, how would they describe you as a parent mm -hmm. boy that's a tough one uh, it's hard to see yourself through through your children's eyes. Uh, you know, part of what we what we have gone through with with the children, uh, uh, particularly I, I, with the son. You know, the 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 uh, this, when the son's in the teens, sixteen, seventeen, they don't even watch you around, uh, and uh, and then uh, when they they get into school, you know, into college, uh, they will tolerate you because uh, you're a, you're a lifeline. You know, you're you're uh, underwriting their their uh, education, or at least in some parts, you're underwriting their education. And then suddenly, when when they're about I don't know, 28, 29, 30, different times for for different, they become your buddy. Uh, and, and my son is really my best friend, or one of my best friends now. But that didn't happen until he was 30. You know, we hunt together, we fish together, we, uh, we go to lunch together, and, and it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a changing dynamic as the, as the child gets older. And we're a very close family. We, we probably get together as a family, uh, and all, my, all of the children live within an hour of, of where we are today. And uh, we get together uh, for birthdays and, and uh, holidays and, and cookouts and, and so on, probably uh, a couple of times a month. Uh, okay. and, uh, and they, you know, I've had some medical difficulties and they've been very important in recovery and support so on. So it's, uh, as I said, they're good people. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. 
Now, going back even further, we discussed earlier childhood and, and parents and so forth. What uh, do you think was the the uh, the most significant contribution your parents made to you as you were growing up? Uh, I, as I said earlier, that's a tough question because it it uh, it certainly came by indirection. I mean, it was not preaching. I never remember my parents saying, you should go to college. You, know, you should get a good job. You should... Uh, 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 they were more concerned with us as people than they were as, as longer-term career in my memory. So I wish I knew how they did it because, you know, I'd, I'd bottle it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, uh, they seemed to make it work for all of us. And, and I never, never recall my father or mother pushing in any direction, uh, be it school or personal life or, or job situations or anything else. It just, uh, they were supportive but not pushing. And uh, they were there when you had a question and, and if you didn't raise the question, they didn't get pushy. So. Who do you think you're more like, your mother or father? My father. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm goal directed, and and my mother was was the compassionate one in the in the pair, and uh, and so if I needed a shoulder to cry on, it was my mother. You know, if I needed a kick in the butt, it was my dad. Mm -hmm. so. Now you mentioned you were from a very large family. Well, my my father's family and my mother's family were very large. Mm -hmm. uh, we ha I had three three sisters. Our family was, was okay. four. Okay. So, and you know, these are interesting. You we mentioned in your introduction that uh, you had an interest in history and and so right. forth. Um, other than it's sort of a speculative question, on, other than the present time. If you could choose any historical era to have lived in, which uh, era would you have uh, chosen? Probably the Renaissance. I mean, there were so many interesting things going on at that particular period, period in in science and the arts and, and and so on. I don't think we've ever had a period like that. Uh, in the in the rest of history before or after uh, and uh, uh, it would have I wouldn't want to wear their funny clothes but it would be a, a fun time to be alive I think although your life expectancy would be a lot shorter at mm -hmm. that point than, than it is right now but uh, I uh, that's kind of a top of the head reaction but but there are a lot of periods that that uh, are interesting uh, the post World War II period, when there was such pent up demand, and and you had to stand in line to buy automobiles and washing machines and so on, uh, would be an interesting time to see how that whole mass consumption, mass production, balanced out in 1945 to maybe 1952 or three. Uh, it. Uh, uh, the Great Depression might have been a, uh, an interesting time to to uh, to be alive, and uh, and uh, that's a kind of a a certainly was a most difficult period. But I mean, be alive and be older, so you could understand what was going on at that time. So now, in terms of sort of related to that, if you could meet any historical person. Uh, and chat with them and, and so on. Who do you think that might be? If you could pick any one person. Can I pick two? Sure. Okay. I, I would pick Machiavelli and and uh and Einstein. If I could have dinner with each of those people. Not together but separately. Mm -hmm. uh, why would you why did you pick those two? Well Machiavelli had insight uh that that has been durable for 500 years uh, from when he wrote it and uh, and uh, a lot of people 
uh, still read Machiavelli uh, to understand the, the machina machinations of of, uh, of business or organizations, and and he must have been a very clever uh, attendant to his friends, uh, and uh, and if you look at his work, he must have been a bright fellow and an interesting fellow to talk to, living during that period. Einstein was was absolutely brilliant, and 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 changed the course of the world. I I think. He would be a. Mm -hmm. I'd read his book first. I'm in the middle of it, but but uh, then I'd like to meet with him. Now, if you personally could be anyone in history, who uh, would that be? Well, that is a tough question. Maybe Einstein, because again, he changed the world. Uh, and and some for better, some for worse, but he changed the world, uh, and and had the vision to to make that happen. I, I mean, there are other people like that, a lot of other people like that, but he's probably the one of the most renowned brains. Okay. Now, some general information questions, uh, and perhaps we may have touched on these briefly, but. Uh, is there perhaps a single or a little known fact or something really intriguing uh, about you that uh, most people probably wouldn't know about you? Mm. I'm trying to think. I, uh, you lead a relatively public life as a professor. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I guess I, I I'm a coin collector. Most people don't know that. A numismatist. A numismatist, <laughs> right? Uh, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, and uh, and uh, uh, it's it's a hobby. I'm a photographer. Uh, I have several great cameras. I take a lot of pictures, uh, and. Uh, and when I, it's a way of relaxing both of those hobbies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I don't think most people know that that I'm a, that those are my hobbies. Uh, most people probably don't think I have any hobbies. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's true. Now, as you uh, look back at your life, what is there anything you would do differently? You know, we talked about specific things, perhaps, but more macro, general things that you might have done differently. Uh, I probably would have done more high-risk empirical research. Uh, we were talking about choices earlier. Uh, and one of the choices you have, at least you have when you become a professor, is to do high-risk research, to do a project that lasts a year or two and, and comes to naught. And you say, too bad, I'll find another one. Uh, and, and I think I would have, if I could do it over again, I would have done more high-risk empirical research uh, and, and I think that's a responsibility in producing knowledge and I haven't done as much of that as I probably should have uh, in, in my career uh, so I would do that differently in my career uh, and and uh, uh, you know we we talk about leverage. The downside of leverage is you have to go after high potential with low input. You know, that, that what you're trying to do with limited resources is to get a big bang and where you're using leverage. Well, the downside of that is that you don't take risks. Uh, and, and we had a couple of, here at Ohio State, we had a couple of, of 
of uh, projects from Department of Transportation early on, uh, after I arrived here. Uh, we found them so burdensome uh, trying to manage a project with a limited number of people uh, and all the demands of compliance in the Department of Transportation and so on that we said, as a policy, we said, we're not going to do this anymore because we don't have the resources to spend in bureauc bureaucratic interchanges. Uh, at the time, that seemed like a good decision. Uh, I might want to review that decision now. Uh, and, and, you know, we could have perhaps acquired the resources somehow. Uh, we could have structured them so we could sponsor more resources and stuff. Uh, and we tried a couple of times, but it, uh, in that kind of a business, you, you strike out every once in a while. And so we, we decided that we wouldn't spend all the resources putting together proposals that, that we had low probability of getting. We would do things like we did. And, uh, and I think uh, I would review that decision if I had a chance to review it again. Well, combining both the personal and professional aspects of your life, um, how do you or would you like people to remember Bud Lalonde? Uh, entrepreneur, contributor, uh, I guess is I guess interested in building the discipline and investing in the discipline uh, as opposed to exploiting the discipline. Uh, a person of integrity. Uh, some mix of those kinds of things. Okay. Is there anything that you're really bad at that you'd love to be good at? <laughs> I'm bad at a lot of things. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I can't work the Sunday New York Times puzzle. Uh, and I've come close, but I've never finished uh, a uh, Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle. Uh, so I guess I'm bad at that. Uh, I understand Clinton can finish one of those in eight minutes. Uh, I, uh, it takes me considerably longer and I don't finish one. Uh, they, uh, uh, I, I, I sometimes have a habit of having too high expectations of people. And, and, uh, and it gets me in trouble sometimes. So uh, I, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm not as smooth as I would like to be in interpersonal communication. Maybe I should go to charm school or something. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, uh, I sometimes let the object, my objectives, override the, the personal relationships, and and. Uh, and I'm getting better at that, I think, as I get older and mellower. But but uh, uh, that's been a that's been a character trait that's caused me trouble in, in my academic career. Okay, you mentioned uh, growing up, uh, going to a Catholic uh, school, then to Notre Dame, which is a Catholic university. Uh, what role has religion played in your life? Well, a pretty important one. Uh, uh, I think that that uh, that you can't you can't go to to 20 years of of religious education in in one form or another from you know metaphysics to to the, the uh, Baltimore Catechism without having some impact on the way you live your life. Uh, I I am not. Uh, I think religion has had, again, an, an indirect uh, impact uh, on my life. Uh, it has has made me want to be uh, uh, a person that that uh, that respects and honors the the, the people around you. Uh, it has has made me want to to instill that in my children. 
At one point I taught catechism, teaching catechism to a group of 13 year olds was the hardest job I've ever had in my life. It's, it's, it's one of the, you, t you said, what did I fail at? <laughs> That's one of the things I, I think I failed at if you ask the students. It's very tough to motivate a group of 13 year olds or 14 year olds, uh, or at least I find it. That, uh, mm -hmm. I found it very difficult. So, uh, it, uh, yeah, it has played an important role in my life in shaking, shaping my behavior and, and educating my children. And, uh, and, uh, I, I expect it will continue even into retirement. So, now as you look back at your, uh, both, uh, growing up and professional years, were there any, what you might consider consider significant turning points that occurred uh, in either the professional or personal side that uh, uh, you look at today as being uh, the most significant events in your life? Well, one of the most significant events in my life was was uh, was in 1958. I, th I said 1968, my wife would kill me, but uh, that's, uh, we were married in 1958, uh, and, and we had been married mostly happily for 49 years. Uh, we're celebrating our 50th uh, next September, so, uh, and, uh, and that's an achievement, I think, uh, to have two people live close together for 50 years and, and not want to kill one another. Uh, but uh, no, seriously, we uh, we uh, have had a very happy marriage, and uh, and that's uh, you know with fifty percent of the people getting divorced, that's a fairly unusual thing. So uh, I guess I'm proud of that, and that certainly was a watershed event in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other was was getting accepted and going to Catholic Central High School because it taught me what I could do and I got prodded in the direction of performance that I hadn't been prodded in before and I was around a very selective group of students and it, it uh, made a difference in my life. I think getting my scholarship to college was a, was a turning point. I think being at Michigan State when when basically physical distribution was was being born and and uh knowing all the people there that were the the uh, originators and and starters had a very important influence on my career uh, i think the decision to come to ohio state was a decision at the right time for me uh and uh and so i've been fortunate to make uh, uh, either lucky or good decisions uh, as I move through my career, and uh, and uh, I think the good Lord has been looking over me on these decisions I've made. So uh, I uh, uh, I think there's there have been those have been the kind of watershed points when I shifted academically, career-wise, and, and and so on that that has led me to where I am today. Now with 60 plus dissertations that you've chaired uh, over the years, if you were uh, uh, still active in, in the uh, profession now, um, what advice would you give a newly minted PhD? Well, the, the mistake that most newly uh, minted PhDs make is they don't use their diff dissertation effectively, um, and and it's kind of my view of a dissertation is it ought to be uh, you know from the from the point of view of the the uh, the person writing the dissertation uh, the, the the advisor has to walk a narrow line between being a a a judge of what's going on and a motivator for what's going on, but not a controller of what's going on. Uh, 
and and you don't want to say I wrote sixty dissertations you know, for all these people out there. They wrote the dissertation. My job was to kind of push, prod, judge, and and make sure they did the best they could on their their dissertation. Now, having said that, what a dissertation, in my view, does for a, a doctoral candidate is it la launches their professional career. Uh, that is, uh, whatever it is you've done, it's a, it's a solo research effort. Uh, it should be done properly, a good solo uh, uh, research effort. If it's done properly in a timely topic, it should allow you to get started in terms of articles, research directions, research streams, and, and so on. I mean, it's a year's work. It ought to be after all the coursework and stuff. It ought to be able to, to be a foundation for your career. And that isn't to say you can't change uh, directions uh, later on or add research streams or, or whatever. I mean, like you say, you're free to choose. And that's a blessing and a curse. So, so uh, but it gives you the start. Uh, and, and I think the mistake that, that most people do is, or most people uh, make if they're going into the academic field is that they don't use their dissertation effectively. The Supply Chain Doctor interviews thought leaders and visionaries who have had an impact on the field of supply chain management, shares professional development concepts for practitioners, and investigates current and future trends in the industry. Interested in sponsoring this show to help you get your message out, send a note to Chris at the scdr.com. We can also help with world-class supply chain education and workshops for you and your team. Thanks for listening.